The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today um, for this presentation. Oops. All right, so just wanna quickly mention um, before we get started, um, our commitment to education during the COVID-19. Um, we know that you guys have been making adjustments to your organizations and our commitment to you is to support you with plant, plant health care science and education that will help to continue to grow your business during these unprecedented times. All right, so who am I? This is me. Um, my name is Allison Harrell. I'm an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Um, my major roles are to provide support to our territory managers through hands-on trainings, presentations, and research and development. Um, just a quick background on how I got here. I did my undergraduate work at Valparaiso University um, with majors in biology and chemistry. I uh, took a couple of years off, worked a variety of different field jobs doing tree surveys, um, some conservation and restoration work. I worked for a year with the Nature Conservancy on the East Coast. Um, and then I went back to school to get my master's degree. Um, I studied at Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs with a focus in urban forestry and ecology. After I finished my master's, I took a job with Davy Tree and I'm here in Chicago right now. Um, so I spent six years with Davy Tree um, doing everything from dragon brush to climbing trees, um, working as a plant health care technician, and then eventually I was a consulting sales arborist for the last three years. And then last year, so I'm coming up on my one year anniversary with Rainbow, um, I took this job. So I've been a certified arborist and a pesticide applicator for about seven years now. And just as a note, I'm currently here in Chicago functioning as the Midwest arborologist, but I am transferring to the West Coast later this year. So while I have quite a bit of experience dealing with pests in the Midwest, I am certainly seeking your help, um, you guys, the California West Coast experts, as I make the transition. So if you can help me by letting me know if there are any main pests or pathogens that you deal with um, to help me expand my knowledge and so I can figure out how to best support you, um, any advice would certainly be welcome. I'm going to excitedly take on like the newbie role on the West Coast. So with that, I'll quickly mention Brian Bruce. He is the Southwest Territory Manager based in Southern California. Um, I'll flash his contact information at the end as well. And he will be in charge of following up with any questions that you guys may have after the presentation. Quickly want to highlight a few upcoming webinars that we've got. Um, the main one that's applicable to you all is in mid-May. We've got the California Pest Issues. That's going to be with Dr. Igor Lakin. He is the University of California Cooperative Extension Advisor, and he is based in the Bay Area. So he's going to be talking about some emerging pest issues, probably some old ones as well. Um, and he is more of a NorCal expert. So if you are calling in from Northern California, that would be a good one for you to hit. Um, the register online is the same way that you registered for this. OK, housekeeping items. Here at Rainbow, we definitely pride ourselves on our safety, so I encourage you to just do a brief safety assessment wherever you are, maybe in your home, maybe your office, just make sure that you don't have any hazards around you. Um, for the Q&A process, um, if you look over on the right side of the screen, there's a little box. Uh, just type any questions that you may have throughout the presentation into that box, and Matt, who is also on the line, will assist me with those questions at the end of the presentation. And then just to note that this is being recorded and the video link will be emailed out and I will cover the CEU process at the end. Okay, so who is Rainbow? What do we stand for? Um, basically, Rainbow started as a tree care company focusing on PHC, um, doing only Dutch Elm disease treatments in the 70s. It then was able to expand into a full tree care company that's based only in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. Um, and then about 20 years ago, RTSA, Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, was born. And our whole mission is to provide science-based protocols 
to plant healthcare professionals to increase the predictability, the efficacy, and the operational efficiency to help you all grow your businesses. These are just our values really quickly. You can read through, I won't read through them, but we really hold true to them. Um, and then the most important value that we have here that's, again, applicable to you is that we are science-based. Uh, we did over 150 research trials in 2019. We partner with leading industry and university scientists. Here are some of our major partners. And let's get started into the good stuff. All right, so you are here for the California Pest Management Webinar focusing on invasive shot hole borer and gold spotted oak borer. Outcomes for today, we're gonna just overview of plant healthcare best management practices using a true, true toolbox approach. And then I'm gonna do just a quick overview of tree injection best management practices. We will then dive into the invasive shot hole borer and gold spotted oak borer, life cycles biology, and then treatment protocols for both of those, highlight a couple of other key pests and treatments, and then kind of go into the next steps, identify how we can support you. All right, so chemical application techniques. Um, we've got a variety of different things out there in our toolbox. So the systemic op applications, we've got our tree injections, micro and macro injections, soil applications, those can happen as a soil drench or a soil injection. We've got our basal systemic bark sprays. And then on our non-systemic side, we've got foliar sprays and trunk and limb sprays. So those non-systemic are typically targeted at pests that need to be directly contacted with that insecticide. Um, and I'll just run through these quickly. Okay, so our spray applications. We've got our foliar spray, trunk and limb sprays, which I just mentioned, those are our contact sprays, typically targeted at pests or pathogens that need to be directly touched by our product. And that could be because of their life cycle, or it could be just the fact that no other treatment options are out in existence yet. Um, one example of this is certainly foliar fungal problems. Uh, I know a lot of you and a lot of tree care professionals really depend on doing those foliar applications um, because there's just not a lot, a lot of other options out there. Um, important things here, you need complete coverage and correct timing. These can be difficult with rain and wind. Um, you need the product to dry so it can be taken up properly. You also need it to stay in one place. So worried about drift, otherwise you're risking chemical trespass. And then if there are a lot of targets like people or cars, you all know it can be pretty tricky. Um, and then open waterways, obviously that could be a violation of the label. The label is law, so never violate that. Um, and then the other thing that we often deal with is the public perception and the concern around sprays. I feel like there's just kind of rising concerns around that. It's important to note that we are no longer like a spray and pray industry, but I think that there's still kind of that conception out there. Then on the right, we've got basal bark sprays. These are systemic, but I'm just including this on the same slide because it is also a spray application. We deal with some of the same kind of issues. Uh, advantages to doing basal bark sprays over a soil application or injection um, could be because they're very quick and easy to complete. You don't need any fancy equipment, just a backpack sprayer, which can be pretty inexpensive. And then depending on the product, you can actually use less product, which then will save you on overhead costs. Um, again, wind here is a factor, but not quite as much as the big foliar applications. Um, public perception could still be an issue because some clients are really sensitive um, to pesticides or insecticides. Um, or fungicides and have no sprays allowed. Um, and then certainly it is not an option for all products, but it, it does exist out there. Okay, soil applications. Um, on the left, we've got our soil drench. So the best practice for this is to dig a trench around the trunk of the tree, remove any soil, dose the product, and then pour it around equally. Um, this is actually kind of lovely because it requires no equipment, just a trowel, a jug, and a measuring cup. So it's really great to add this on if you're running a spray rig, doing a bunch of different applications, and then maybe Mrs. Smith needs this done at her property at the same time. So you can get two applications done at once. Uh, this can be a little problematic sometimes. It doesn't always look super professional. Um, when I was in the field and would do soil applications, people would look over my shoulder a lot and ask me why I was pouring milk around the base of the tree. And 
as you can see in this photo, that's exactly what it looks like. So when you're kind of considering your customers are likely paying a good amount of money, having finicky people could get upset that they are paying too much for something that doesn't look like it should cost that much. Um, so then I'll just highlight on the right the soil injection. Um, there are a variety of different injection tools out there, some like flow meter, some you have to calibrate on your own. Um, but with any of these, they do look pretty professional. Uh, you can run them off of a motorized backpack sprayer or a rig. So those give you a little bit more flexibility. Um, and then I, I'm just highlighting here, this is our tool, the HTI 2000. It's a great way to deliver soil applications, um, super um, convenient and has a really precise dosing chamber on here. So you can run a variety of different products through this specific tool. One of them being growth regulators, which I'll touch on later, but those require really specific dosing. So that's kind of where that really high level calibration is, is nice to have. All right, so now we get into tree injections. On the left, we've got our macro injection system. Uh, this is the industry best managed practice best management practice typically used in, con in conjunction with um, fungicides for vascular wilt. So those would be like Dutch elm disease or oak wilt. Um, we also would use this system for micronutrient injections such uh, as iron or manganese. And for all of those issues, it's really because of the distribution in the canopy. So it's important to note um, that the key is distribution. You have a higher volume of water because you want to get all of that pushed out into, into the vascular tissue of those trees to protect them. Um, a couple of little cons with this system. They are a little bit more labor intensive because typically you need to spend a little bit more time excavating the root flare, cleaning them off, and then you do have to drill more holes than you do with the micro injection system. So it's about every five inches or so around the base of the tree. So as we know, every time we drill into the tree, that's something that we're forcing them to compartmentalize and heal. Um, so with more holes, more, more things that need to get healed. All right, then on the right, we've got our micro injection systems. These are for our more small volume treatments. So typically our insecticides. And then usually the reason we're able to get away with this equipment with the smaller holes, less injection sites, um, is because those insecticides have a little bit more lateral movement throughout the tree. Um, we don't need to be worried about getting distribution to every single inch um, around the root flare as we do with macro infusion. And then these injections are typically very quick. The industry has made a lot of headway creating chemistries that are both effective and have really good uptake time. So, much less cumbersome, better equipment, better, better chemicals out there. And there's just a kind of an example. I wish these were flipped, but micro injection, less holes, less distribution on the on the right, macro infusion, we get a better distribution. And that's really important for the coverage on some of the diseases that we manage with that. Okay, so just a selection of the different types of branded products we offer. Please ask us for a catalog or check out our website if you have any questions on these things. Briefly, we'll highlight the three products that I will be talking about so you know what I mean when I say Zytec, Transtec, and Mectinite. Um, Zytec are, are imidacloprid products. We have three different ones, Zytec 2F, 75, water soluble packet, and Zytec 10%. So the first two can be used as a soil drench or a soil injection, and Zytec 10% can be used as a trunk injection. Um, pros slash cons with Zytec, a little bit slower uptake time. So as a soil injection, those take 30 to 120 days to reach the upper canopy of the tree. As an injection, only two weeks. Um, so certainly something to consider, but you do get a full season of residual using that product. Then we move to Transtec, that is our Dinotefurin product. Um, that can be applied as soil drench, soil injection, or a basal bark spray. Um, fast uptake time within one to two weeks, and we get residual for about three to six months. So um, sometimes with this, you'll need a reapplication. Uh, peaks around uh, 90 days or so, and then kind of starts to wane off and still have some efficacy into that six month mark. And then last, mectinite, that is our Emma Mectin Benzoate 4% product that is applied as a trunk injection. Um, it's got 
really fast uptake, one to two weeks, and up to two years of control, depending on the pest. So for borers, for sure, two years. Other pests, we really only recommend suppression in the second year. Um, but then we're working on studies for more of this and some, some other studies for different pests would have a little bit longer residual. Okay, so tree injection best management practices. Just want to note here, um, this is a tree injection BMP released by ISA in 2016. Um, this was signed on by 21 different collaborators within the industry. It was authored by Dr. Tom Smiley and Sean Burnick, who is actually my boss. Um, but this is an ISA tool for you guys to use. So hopefully, I know we've got a lot of ISA certified arborists on here, um, but this is a great tool for you to utilize, especially if you've got newer applicators within your business. Um, you can get it on their website, it's only 10 bucks, um, but it's, it's great to highlight some of the BMPs within the industry. All right, so just some keys for tree injection applications. Target the root flares, use sharp drill bits, do not unnecessarily spin the drill bit in the hole, space injections evenly around the tree, drill to the appropriate depth, and the treatment timing is based on the phenology of the tree. Um, host condition and pest biology is important for efficacy and operational efficiency. So injection site placement, around the root flare. So you can see we excavated the root flare out on this a little bit. You may not always need to, but we do see a lot of telephone pole trees, so you may need to excavate to find it. Um, avoid those deep crevices within there and avoid being higher up on the trunk. The reason we aim for these um, nice root flares is because um, they've got more meristematic tissue, better uptake, and better healing time. Drill bits. This is a pitfall, I feel, with a lot of people whenever they're having issues with injections. Use razor sharp drill bits. This allows the tissue to be cut instead of ripped. Using those high helix drill bits, spending the extra couple bucks um, is really, really worth it. And replace those drill bits frequently about every 10 trees. For drilling, do not spin the drill bit. So we've seen a bunch of application videos circulating on the internet where people are just like drilling in and out, in and out. Don't do that, just start it, quick and clean continuous motion, make a surgeon-like cut just in and then out, and you're gonna make that injection, or not injection, um, well, sort of that drill hole perpendicular to the root flare as you see in the photo there. Treatment timing, like I mentioned, uptake is best um, when it's timed correctly with the phenology of the tree. When trees are healthy, full, leafed out, and vigorous, um, this is usually the best time for treatments. Just a couple of exceptions to that. One would be injecting iron during full leaf out. We do see phytotoxicity with that. So just make sure you're following the label, depending on the protocols. And then avoid treating when trees are stressed out or have serious dieback. So I know it can be really tempting to go in and treat trees um, just to give them maybe like a last ditch effort. But a lot of times uh, if the trees are too stressed or have too much dieback, it's, it's not gonna do anything. So just being mindful that that is part of the toolbox approach. Just a few general concerns around tree injection with wounding. Um, like I mentioned, anytime you drill into a tree, you are creating a wound and it has to compartmentalize. So we see some pretty serious wounding on these trees right here. I just bring this up, like I mentioned, I am an Illinois resident still right now, and we had this huge public outcry in Quincy, Illinois here. Um, like I said, Rainbow, our whole goal is to make arboriculture a reputable profession. Um, we generally think of tree injection as, as a reputable thing, right? Um, but you do need to be mindful. Um, here in my home state, this town, Quincy, hired a contractor to treat over 1,200 ash trees for emerald ash borer. Instead, every single one of their trees looks like this photo, um, a extensive trunk damage. So there was a ton of public outcry. There was questions whether these trees were even protected because how do you know the chemical got where it needed to go? These are starting to decay. Are they gonna die and become hazardous? And where on earth are you supposed to go in and treat in two years when there's complete decay throughout the entire bottom of that tree? So this is why I bring this up. Um, 
we at Rainbow have been working to ensure correct procedures are taking place, as well as developing alternative equipment, which I'm going to talk about just quickly on the next slide. So practices to minimize tree wounding. Like I said, in, avoid injecting high up on the trunk. You really want to aim for the root flare. And then drill to the proper depth. If you're using plugs, you may need to make sure that those get set at the proper depth as well, because if they're too deep, you're not gonna get that product in the right spot. If they're too shallow, you're gonna get this really deep bark cracking that separates the bark, which you can see in the photo on the right. So injection in the root flare plus potentially no plugs, which I'll show you, which is smaller drill holes, equals faster compartmentalization. So just a plug for our plugless equipment, if, if you're not familiar, um, this is the Q Suite. We developed this to meet uh, all uh, micro injection needs, kind of depending on the site and quantity of trees. They feature, just look at the bottom, the stainless steel tips for plugless injections. And this can be used with a variety of different chemistries, less damage to the trees as we discussed. There is no high pressure. So it's just a low pressure that we start to pump it up. And then we allow the trees natural um, vascular tissue to take up the product. And then there's no wasted money on plugs and no wasted time setting those plugs. And then the sites are smaller, the injection sites are smaller because you only need to use a 15 uh, drill bit. Okay, cultural practices. They're just as important as the chemical things, honestly. So mulch. I know we love turf, uh, but honestly mulch is one of the best things you can do to make a tree healthy. Uh, just some data on the left here, Dr. Gary Watson. It increases, increases the root density and mycorrhizae, increases moisture content and lowers pH. And I just love the graphic on the right because you can see how much nicer that root system is underneath the mulch versus the grass. So our root enhancement recommendations. So honestly, this is another great thing that we can do for our trees, but I think we kind of forget about it. Uh, typically in urban environments, our trees are already kind of living in these really stressed and compacted areas. So there are things that we can do to remediate that. One thing is using the air spade for uh, alleviating that soil compaction and removing any girdling roots with an air tool. So that's what I just said. That's what it looks like. Then you can add prescription organic matter or fertilizer as determined uh, by a soil analysis, ideally. And then add mulch and water and look how beautiful that looks and how much healthier that root system is gonna be. I will quickly touch on growth, growth regulators, so plant growth regulators. Cambostat is our product. This is Paclobutrazol. It's a type two plant growth regulator. So what this does is that it reduces the elongation of the meristematic tissue at the end of those branches. So you can see in the photo on the right um, where it's regular growth and then where it's treated growth, it's a lot less that it's putting on. And I, the, the little graphic on the left just kind of shows the length of those cells. And so this is important to note. Um, Campusat is very useful for reducing vegetative growth on trees when it is needed, um, but it also has some great secondary benefits to allow your trees to be healthier and less susceptible to pests, um, especially because a lot of these trees, we're gonna be talking about oaks, and sycamores and London plane trees, those are huge trees generally to begin with. So a lot of times growth regulators could be helpful for those trees anyway. You can check out our YouTube page for hours of content on this or feel free to ask questions. We love talking about this. I have hours of presentations, but I'm gonna talk for one more minute and that's it. Okay, so uh, how these work, the first change reduces gibberellic acid. That is the cell elongation hormone. So what that does, is reduces that elongation and enlargement of new tissue. Um, a secondary benefit of that is that it allows, frees up those elements to create some more chlorophyll. And then the second change that occurs with this is that it increases abscisic acid. So what that is, is the plant protection hormone. That hormone stimulates root, gr root growth, triggers closing of stomata to keep up with transpiration. So that can help with droughty conditions. And then it protects those cells from dehydration and stimulates those phytodefense compounds. So this is how this helps. 
this is taken from Dr. Dan Herms at Ohio State, um, but basically the tree energy budget theory is that trees have a finite amount of energy. There are five uses, growth, reproductive, reproductive structures, roots, defense compounds, and storage compounds. And you can see this is on the left, vegetative growth is the number one thing that trees typically expend energy on. But when you treat with canvastat, it reduces that growth and pushes that energy into these other things. So you'll notice more reproductive structures, more root growth, more defense compounds, all good things to help keep your tree healthier and happier and less susceptible to issues. Important to note, some pests have numerous treatment options. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this when we get to the gold spotted oak borer, um, but there are several different things that you can do. And this is important to remember because integrated pest management really is about using a toolbox approach. So you're gonna try to diagnose your problems properly. You're gonna review both cultural and chemical options, and you're gonna determine the best application technique given the pest and the pathogen and the site. I think it's also important to mention here, you know, PhD is a comprehensive program for managing the health, appearance, structure, and vitality of plants in the landscape. Um, this all occurs within expectations of your clients and keeping their budgets in mind. So sometimes that does mean picking and choosing and every client has a different threshold for what they're willing to tolerate, whether it's sprays or not, whether it's holes in their leaves or not, um, just a lot of variety of things to manage. So if you do have questions on that, always feel free to give us a call on our tech support line. We'd be more than happy to kind of help balance things out for you if you're ever concerned about that stuff. Okay. So now what we are here for, um, the invasive shot hole borer. So the problem, uh, polyphagous shot hole borer and carucio shot hole borer, we are now grouping both together as invasive shot hole borer. Um, they are ambrosia beetles. They originate from Southeast Asia. Um, polyphagous shot hole borer was identified in 2003 in LA County and the carucio Shot hole borer was confirmed in San Diego in 2014. So relatively recent pests to the landscape. Both of these ambrosia beetles vector a symbiotic fungus um, for their young to feed on in the galleries of the tree. So they are the vector for this fusarium dieback, fusarium wilt. The trees generally are not directly killed by the boring of this beetle, but rather the fungus, which clogs all of the conductive tissue of the tree that cuts off the water and nutrients within the plant. Um, so severe injury can vary. Um, it can be a single branch that dies back or the entire tree. So the biology of this beetle, it's very small, as you can see um, on the picture with the coin. They measured about 0 0.07 to 0 0.1 inches long. They're black or brown in color. The female be beetle bores into susceptible trees, lines the galleries that she creates with spores of the fusarium fungus. After about eight days, the female lays her eggs in a pile at the end of the gallery. Then those larvae hatch and they begin to feed on those fungal spores throughout the gallery. They feed for about a month and then the larvae pupate and become adults. You can see the little picture on the right. And then most actually are female, but then what ends up happening is the females that do hatch um, mate with their sisters essentially from the same group of offspring. And then the inseminated females fly up to one to two miles to find new host trees. And it's important to note that the invasive shot hole borers have, can have multiple generations in a year. All right, so hosts. There are over 200 species of trees that are susceptible. Um, this tree can come, or sorry, this pest can complete its life cycles on at least 60 identified tree species. Um, I just pulled a few major species here on the right. Uh, box elder were the first species to be impacted in San Diego County. And then I pulled the sycamore and London plane tree because I know Southern California has quite a lot of those within there hoas and landscape trees. And then populus and quercus species, which are kind of important to note because both of those um, get really large. So when we're talking about risk and losing big trees, that, that can be pretty important. But again, over 200 species of trees in addition to this. 
the distribution is currently mostly just down here in Southern California, as you can see right down to the border of Mexico. We've got both, both species of those shot hole borers. Diagnosis and symptoms. So different trees respond to the invasive shot hole borer a little bit differently. So this can be a variety you can see in these photos. Some of them is just staining. Some is like this sugary exudate. So they call that the sugar volcanoes, which you can see kind of coming out of some of those photos. Gumming and frass. And a lot of times that's noticed before the beetles, because as rem remember, those beetles are tiny. Um, and the beetles entry and exit holes are only 0.85 millimeters, so less than a millimeter in diameter. It can be located beneath or near the symptoms. And I think that's the quintessential photo, the shot hole borer on the left. That's exactly why it's named the way that it is. The holes are a perfect circle and about the size of a ballpoint pen. So that's the entry and exit hole. Sometimes you can see the abdomen of that beetle. So that's what that photo is showing is the abdomen of the female beetle sticking out of the hole, guarding the developing larva. The middle photo, that's um, the fusarium fungus that causes discoloration of the wood beneath the bark around the beetle galleries. So if you scrape away the bark around the entry hole, you can sometimes see that black staining. And then on the right, you see fungal infections uh, eventually lead to branch dieback or entire canopy dieback. So how do you distinguish from lookalikes? Um, there are quite a few different vascular wilt diseases and cankers. Um, it can be hard to differentiate them from other ambrosia beetles. And it can also just be, how do you tell if it, this is dieback or general canopy dieback? So the other vascular wilts and cankers do not have the holes in frass. So you're gonna be looking for those shot holes and the frass. Um, hard to differentiate from other ambrosia beetles. Usually the other ambrosia beetles are um, secondary pests, and this is more of a comes in and impacts healthy trees, though certainly can be exacerbated by um, an unhealthy tree as well, as, as all things can be. And then general canopy dieback, if you've got really intense dieback, potentially it's too late to treat, or you, if it's just minor dieback, you can use general cultural management approaches that we just talked about, as well as pruning. Um, to hopefully get those trees looking back in order. But as we mentioned, proper diagnosis. All right, so treatment and prevention from a cultural standpoint. Treatment can be tricky since the invasive shot hole board does not directly feed on the tree, rather it feeds on the fungus growing in the galleries. Um, so from a prevention standpoint, you're gonna chip infested wood into uh, one inch or smaller. If branches are too large to chip, you need to solarize them under a tarp. And again, always avoiding movement of infested firewood and chipping matter. So that's how a lot of these pests get spread. So just don't move that firewood. All right, so now we're getting into the chemical treatment and preventions out there. Um, so there are a few studies that have been done. Basically what it comes down to is that these treatments will reduce attacks and delay mortality, but right now, none of these really guarantee protection. So this is where that conversation with your client comes in. If they're willing to throw the kitchen sink at them, there's quite a few things that we can do to help prevent. Um, or, you know, if we're starting to see symptoms and start treating, that's great. Um, number one, like I mentioned before, mectinite, that is our emamectin benzoate, um, tree injection, last for two years. You can do it anytime during the growing season. The second option, that's mectinite and injectable propiconazole together. Um, and basically what that does is it attacks both the pest as well as the fungus. And then we've also seen some of the studies have showed uh, pretty good results as far as reducing um, using trunk and limb sprays of a permethrin or a bifenthrin. But again, the studies right now are not 100% guarantee. Like I said, we're trying to give you predictable results the best that we can. Um, but right now, things are still kind of kind of up in the air as far as what we've got for something that's going to guarantee things. But these 
uh, these studies show significant reduction, up to 70% reduction in attack. So relatively um, helpful, just not a full guarantee. Okay, so now we get into the gold spotted oak borer. Um, so I'm gonna call this a pseudo-invasive flat-headed borer. And the reason I say pseudo is because it's moving into Southern California from Mexico and Guatemala. So uh, generally when we say like non-native, um, it's like coming from China or somewhere else in Asia. Uh, but in this case, it's more of an expansion of the range than a typical non-native invader. Um, it was first identified in San Diego County in 2004. So again, a relatively new pest uh, and to date, uh, I think the last thing I read said 20,000 trees have, have been killed by this. And it, it's easily identifiable because rapid death rates, um, it kills these oak trees very quickly. Um, and the one thing to note with this is that this can be a catalyst. Um, if it kills a lot of oak trees very quickly and leaves a forested area dead, that's a big catalyst for wildfire risk, um, as well as a huge reduction in wild wildlife habitat and food. So the biology only has a single generation each year. Uh, adults generally have a lifespan of a, a few weeks to a month. Um, adult females lay their eggs in June through September and the larva hatch within a couple of weeks and then bore through the outer bark into the phloem. They then feed in me meandering patterns leaving dark frass filled galleries. And then those mature larvae remain in the non-feeding stage from October all the way until June, uh, April to June of the following year. And then the adults emerge uh, mid-May to September, and then peak flight activity is in the late summer, so late June through July. And then once emerged, those adults do feed on the foliage of the tree. So hosts here are coast live oaks, canyon live oaks, California black oaks and Engelman oaks. Um, and this is a bummer too, because this uh, borer really only impacts trees that are larger than 12 inches. So our more mature trees, mainly only seen on these four species of oaks. And this is important to note uh, for forested areas because we do have quite a lot of susceptible lands in California, especially in San Diego and Riverside County. There's a lot of plots of like multi-acre land um, Native American land with vast populations of these oaks. So um, keeping this in mind as we're, we're looking forward to how we manage this problem. And then the greater impact with this borer is the fact that they're really only going after basically majestic oak trees. So if they're not managed, we really risk losing valuable trees uh, and also having potentially huge hazards. So giant oak trees that are dying quickly and you have to get them out. Um, that's a pretty big challenge, from especially from an urban forestry standpoint. All right, so distribution. Again, we are mostly down in Southern California still. Some pretty good populations of those. But then this is the potential distribution, and this is why we're, we're concerned about this, because this can impact essentially the entire state of California, all the way up into the Pacific Northwest, as well as into the Southwest. So that is all the suitable habitat and we've had enough wild wildfire issues um, this would just fuel that even more not to mention a huge amount of habitat loss okay so diagnosis and symptoms um, so this these photos are exhibiting um, the lower eight feet of the main trunk and around the root collar. So what you usually see, black or dark red staining um, or like bleeding on the bark, as you see kind of in that right photo. Those D-shaped exit holes, um, they are only about 0.15 inches wide. So they're pretty small, um, but not as small as the shot hole bore. And again, D-shaped exit holes because they are a flat-headed bore. And then dark colored frass filled larval feeding galleries under the bark and meandering. And then as you look further up onto the canopy, you'll see thinning of the crown as well as woodpecker feeding. Um, and then sometimes you can see the adults feeding on the leaf margins of those, of those leaves. Okay, so distinguishing from lookalikes. 
a uh, western oak bark beetle can cause that same sort of reddish sap to leak out and discoloration around those entry holes. And then sudden oak death, that's caused by the pathogen uh, Phytophthora, one of the Phytophtheras, um, causes red brown cankers that seep into this sort of like amber sap as well as canopy dieback. So how do you differentiate? Western oak bark beetles um, will have round holes Keep in mind, gold spotted oak borer will have those D-shaped holes, same as emerald ash borer, which is what I deal with a lot. <laughs> and then um, death, when it comes to sudden, differentiating between sudden oak death, the death of the tree due to sudden oak death infection actually takes place after an extended period of disease. So that name is a little bit deceiving because it's not super sudden. It actually usually takes more than two, sometimes even five years from the onset, from what I've seen. All right, so treatment. Um, there are efforts in place to discourage the movement of gold spotted oak borer through the infested firewood. So the buy it where you burn it. This is the same for a lot of other uh, pest things out there, right? You don't want to take any hitchhikers with you. Tarping piles to restrict the inability of those adults to fly and infest other trees after you remove a dead tree if you can't. Um, if the wood piles are not tarped, try to leave the wood on site as long as you can before moving it. So they recommend two years. Um, and then when chipping, you want to try to get it to those less than one inch particle sizes. And then this is the buy it where you burn it. Um, signage that you can see kind of all around. You guys have probably all seen that. All right. So when it comes to more cultural prevention. Um, as I mentioned, we're calling this sort of like pseudo invasive. It does go after healthy trees, but we certainly see it exacerbating, um, exacerbated symptoms on declining trees. And then the other thing to note is more borers as secondary pests come into those declining trees. So it's like a snowball effect. So if we can keep our trees as healthy as possible, that will help, um, especially when we're talking about really valuable client homeowner trees. Camastat can be applied as part of an overall management strategy to help improve the health and vigor of those trees so they can withstand the stress induced by those insects. Adequate watering, especially as you guys get those drought periods, mulching, reducing soil compaction and performing root collar excavations if, if needed, and then prescription-based fertilizer practices. And then here is what these chemical treatments look like. So, um, this graph has a lot on it, so I'll give you a moment. But basically, the top kind of outlines um, the generation of the pest, like what the life cycle looks like, where they pupate, larva, and adults. So we want to do these treatments where they're going to have peak amount of chemical in the tree as the insects are peaking, if that makes sense. So I mentioned these before, but we've got the Zytex. That is our imidacloprid. Those are something that you can do in the, quote, dormant season. I know California doesn't have like a real dormant season, but earlier in that springtime, so February through April. And like we said, that can take quite a while to get up into the tree. So you do it early and then it rises as the population rises. Mectinite injection or Zytec injection, and that you can do, you know, as those trees are in full vigorous growth periods. And that gets up into the tree really quickly. Same as Transtech, so soil or bark, uh, soil or bark spray of Transtec, and both of those, all those products on the bottom two boxes, again, if you remember, have uptake within the first one to two weeks. So if you get them in April, that's, you know, spiking right as those, as those insects are spiking. Okay, so now I'm going to quickly just hit on a couple of other pests. Um, California oakworm. This is just high level. I'm not going to go into super detail. I'm going to just tell you a couple of the things and a couple of treatments that we've got. So California oakworm, uh, sometimes called oak moth. Uh, the hosts are all oaks, but a special, especially those coastal live oaks in Northern California. Uh, they do about two generations per year. Um, and then those caterpillars, you can distinguish they have these little spikes and they can cause skin irritation. Um, they cause severe defoliation from the spring and summer generation. So control options. Um, again, I'm just going to talk about chemical controls here, but mectinite, 
um, can be applied in that early winter period, provide a season long of control. Lepitect, which I did not go over, um, that is our soil applied aspate product. Um, that's a great product because it, it gets taken up really quickly as well. It has a shorter residual, which can be a positive or a negative. Um, so if you're worried about any like sort of flowering species, it does degrade in the tree quickly. So you wouldn't be risking any injury to um, pollinators. Um, but in this case, it may require a couple of applications because of that. And then full year sprays of bifenthrin are effective on larva. But as we know, sometimes sprays just are not feasible. And then this is a little bit of data from an oakworm study on a different type of oakworm, the orange striped oakworm, but they're in the same Lepidoptera. This was in Raleigh, where one of my coworkers is. And basically, if you look at the table at the bottom, um, the treatment of mectinite, just 48 hours of after feeding, a feeding um, drastically reduced that po the population of those oakworms. So we, we do see good results with that application. All right, then we've got the red gum lerp psyllid. This impacts the eucalyptus species, um, which you guys have a plentiful amount of eucalyptus. Um, treatments are soil applied, Zytec transtract, or you could do a tree injection of Zytec 10%. Um, we see really good results with that. Another eucalyptus insect to be on the lookout for is the longhorn borers. Again, same treatments soy applied Zytec, Transtec, or tree injection of mectinite or Zytec 10%. Okay, so good on time. Um, this is how you will report your CEUs. Um, you're gonna receive an email with instructions and documents for self-reporting. And you'll just go to the ISA homepage, go to the dashboard, and then follow the instruction. There'll be a certificate of attendance copied on the email that contains the abstract. You just pop it right in there to get your CEUs. Um, moving forward, they will automatically be done, but ISA has a strict 30-day policy. And since, you know, in lieu of the events, we've kind of put these presentations together in, in quicker fashion, less than 30 days. So that's how that will work. And then just to let you know, we do have support materials for you. Um, you guys use a lot of growth regulators, so I, that's just the one that I pulled on this one. But Trim Tech support materials, but also all of the other products that we offer, we have support materials for, um, application guides. Um, and if you would like to schedule a virtual training for now with your territory manager or arborologist, we are more than happy to do that. And then as soon as we are able to be lifted from the shelter in place. We can't wait to get out there with you guys to be doing some hands-on trainings. And then to let you all know, we do have a technical support line that is always open. This is open to you guys for plant healthcare diagnostics, identification and management uh, recommendations of any kind. If you have product questions um, and a full equipment troubleshooting and field support or ordering any of our products. And so if you need to take a picture of this, you have all that info that is open normal business hours. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to any questions. Thanks, Allison. Looks like we got a couple of questions that came in while you were presenting. So we'll start with those and go from there. Okay, and then I'll just mention quickly, um, Brian Bruce, the territory manager, his info is on here as well. I showed a picture of him at the beginning, but he is also on the line to help answer questions uh, as the resident SoCal guy. All right, so first question, does risk of secondary infection increase with lower injection sites? For example, pathogens splashing into open injection sites. Uh, do you have any research showing that injecting into root flares increases uptake of treatments? Okay, so that will you start with the first, the first multi questions? Sure. So, does risk of secondary infection increase with lower injection sites? Yeah, so um, I think that maybe in regards to like decay, we see less decay when we actually inject into the root flare because we've got better healing tissue within that portion of the root flare, if that makes sense. And if you need further clarification on that, feel free to type in. And second part was, do you have any research showing that injecting into root flares increases uptake of treatments? Um, 
Yes, actually, our service side um, and we have done some side-by-side -side treatments and also have recorded our, our time savings. Um, so I would have to pull that together for you, but we, we have recorded some of that. But just based on the biology of the tree, knowing what we know about cells, um, anecdotally, it, it does make, I mean, anecdotally, I notice it because I do injections. I've done injections for a decade. Um, but yeah, we can, pull that, we can pull that data. So we'll grab your information and we can kind of get something over to you. All right, next question is, could you repeat the CEU information? Ah, yes, absolutely. Okay, so after this is over, you're gonna receive an email with instructions and documents for self-reporting. Unfortunately, because we did not get this in within the 30 days, um, you're gonna have to report it yourself. So if you wanna take a picture of this screen right now, um, you can, but it will also be outlined in the email that we send you after this. All right, and the next question says, uh, thanks for the presentation. Is the support line available to anyone or just Rainbow Tree Care clients? We are open to anyone. Um, if you are like a homeowner, I don't know if we've got any homeowners on here. We are more than happy to answer questions, but more than likely we'll end up referring you to your local arborists um, or the ISA website to find an arborist. But yes, we are open to anyone, regardless of whether you purchase products or not. Um, and we hope though that you would use our support to potentially throw us some of your business if you feel so inclined. And next question, does Pentrabark or any surfactant aid or deplete application? It's a great question. So it depends. Um, research shows, and I'm gonna just speak to TransTech because that's what we generally use as a, as a bark spray. Um, there are a couple of species that do respond really well um, or have better efficacy using puncher bark. So one of those, some of those are like our thinner maple, thinner barked maple species. Um, the only issue that we also see with puncher bark is that it does cause leaf phytotoxicity. So where that comes into problems is like two things. One, if you're client has like plants around the base of the tree then that can damage those plants and then the other thing is like if it, there's lichens or mosses on the outside of that bark um, that can cause discoloration of that because it, it essentially kills those lichens and those and those mosses so um, yes but most of the time it's not required and if you have specific tree species that you want to ask about let us know we won't be more than happy to review that with you All right. All right, next question, let's see here. It says, uh, this may not be to this webinar, but what are your thoughts if an oak tree used to have been watered for years, take the water, what are the results? I'm not 100% sure I got that right. Hmm. It's been... I guess I would question, okay, so this is interesting. Um, I like talking about this. It's not necessarily <laughs> perfectly applicable to this, but um, so I always, I always address this as um, we wanna be watering our trees appropriately. If you are in a droughty area and you have been watering frequently, and then you, you all of a sudden stop, you may see uh, a, you know, an impact. You may see a direct impact on that. Um, if you have been regularly watering, I would really recommend continuing to do that. I mean, we should be watering properly anyway. Um, but yeah, I've seen that before for sure, where people have had a really good sprinkling sprinkler system and then it like got clogged or broke or something, and then all oh, their trees looked super sad. It didn't it didn't matter how much rain we were getting. They were just used to that specific amount. So I don't I don't know if that answers that. Um, but again, type in further questions if you have them or reach out to us and we can chat. No questions as of right now. We can wait a couple more seconds, see if any more come through. Cool. Thank you, Matt, for helping facilitate. Yeah, no problem. 
All right. I think that is all that we have for the day. Cool. I was really worried I was going to go over. So <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, so much for your attentiveness and for listening. If you have any questions, oh, did you? Feel free to reach out to either myself or Brian or um, info at Tree Care Science. We'd be more than happy to help you guys out with any, any questions that you have moving forward. So I guess that's it for today. Oh, and email us or chat me because like I said, I'm, I'm the new person. And if you guys have specific pests that you have that you wanna share with me that you're seeing problems on, I would love to hear about them so I can start preparing as I prepare to move. So thank you.